Hello, welcome everyone to the 2024 webinar series. I'm so pleased to welcome you. We will have six webinars in our 2024 series, um, and this is the very first one. So my name is Satwinder Paul. I'm an associate teaching professor in the Water and Wastewater Technology Program and a co-creator uh, of the Online Help Center for BC Small Water System. Before we be begin, let's do the land acknowledgement that Thompson River University campuses are on the traditional lands of the Tecumlups to Swepmec and the Texelic within the Swepmec Ulu, the traditional and unceded territory of the Swepmec people. Thompson River University hosts an annual webinar series and courses dedicated to providing technical information, resources, and tools to all small water systems, owners and operators, and indigenous small water systems on issues of treatment, regulations, operation, maintenance, and water quality monitoring. The Online Help Center strives to assist all small water systems in BC to implement a multi-barrier approach to drinking water in order for systems to consistently provide safe, potable drinking water to their communities in compliance with government regulations. The webinars are scheduled for every two months, uh, most of the time, sometimes the schedule can vary, and is offered free of charge. For attendees, attendees who are EOCP certified operators, each webinar will count as 0.1 CEUs towards your small water system certification or any other certification. A certificate of completion will be issued to the webinar participants, which then can be submitted to EOCP for your uh, CEUs. We will begin our presentation in a few minutes. The presentation will be for an hour, followed by a half an hour of question period. As we are going through the presentation, and if you have some questions, please post them in the chat section and we'll make sure that they're addressed um, after, okay? So today, our webinar focuses on wildfires, emergency preparedness, and operators' perspective. In 2021, Warren Brown, as the operations and ma maintenance manager of Lytton First Nations, worked through the Lytton fire that consumed about 90% of the town. 39 band structures, including the band office, and again in 2022, when the Nohomeen fire broke out on the west side of Lytton, consuming six more banned homes. Warren will share his perspectives on emergency preparedness in times of wildfires and protecting community infrastructure and water supplies. So Warren Brown is a graduate from Thompson River University, Diploma in Water Treatment Technology, he manages a crew of 10 staff, band buildings, 30 plus kilometers of roads, 12 water systems. He has been with Lytton First Nation since 2020, 2002, and he received his small water system certification the same year. He became the manager in 2016. He's a recipient of many awards and accolades. In 2018, he was awarded the EOCP Water Operator of the Year. In 2021, Water Canada Water Operator and Water Steward. And then he's a recipient in 2023 of the National First Nation Water Leadership Award. Um, over time, um, Warren has become a very uh, dear friend as well. And I welcome him to present to us um, uh, his webinar. Thank you. On to you, Warren. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope that I don't have to push a button here. So, hello, welcome. So, uh, thank you for the intro, Seth Winder. So, as she said, my name is Warren Brown. I'm the O&M manager for Lytton First Nations. I'm, as she said, certified in the water treatment level two water distribution to small water, wastewater systems, small water systems, and a diploma from TRU in the water treatment technology program. Uh, in charge of seven centralized water systems, 
Three of them are groundwater or our surface. We also have five point of entry or POE, individual treatment systems going into five individual homes on two separate reserves. And as she said, we're in charge of about 35 kilometers of roads and a few banned buildings. So where is Lytton? Lytton, also known as Inclacheen, it's four hours north of Vancouver on the Trans-Canada number one highway in the Fraser Canyon, where the Thompson and Fraser rivers meet. One of BC's hotspots is also the area for the George Road, Mohawkum, Lytton Creek, Alkali, Siska, Jackass, Nohomine, Kokopee, Ismin, and Stein Mountain fires. This was from the last three years. The wildfire fires in the community. Lytton First Nation has experienced three wildfires in the last three years that affected us. So as everybody knows, the 2021 Lytton Creek fire that burned 90% of the village of Lytton and 39 structures on Lytton First Nation reserves. About 83,671 hectares were burned in that fire. Cause was undetermined. From the fire, we went into the 2021 November flooding, which washed out a couple parts of our road, which I'll be showing later on in a few slides. Uh, 2022, we had a Nohomine Creek fire. It burned down seven more structures on the Lytton First Nation reserves, came within 20 meters of our main slow, slow sand water plant, and within 10 meters of another small water system, the Seven Mile system. In 2023, Stein Mountain Fire. That burned 4,734 hectares. It came close and threatened more homes on the Lytton First Nation reserves, but nothing was lost uh, on that one. So I'm going to be referring to a bunch of my notes that I wrote from when these fires happened. I, I can't remember everything, so I'll be sort of telling like a little story here. Uh, so the Water Bridge fire, June 29th. This, the day started with... Uh, so it was another hot day, the third day of a record break in heat where Lytton reached the most extreme temperatures we'd ever seen, 49.6 degrees official, according to the news. We received word around 5.30 that a fire started on the east end area of our water bridge, the one that carries our drinking water over the Fraser River. We were able to mobilize our regular work crew and get equipment ready, and by the time we arrived on the fire, the forestry crew was just arriving as well. A few locals had also shown up to help the cause, more bodies to help the fight, more bodies to help fight the fire. Forestry was commending us for being there to help with our water trucks, hoses, and personnel. We had two trucks with 225 gallon water tanks, a three ton truck with an 800 gallon water tank. And with the locals, our crew and BC Wildfire Service crew, we had 20 people on the fire. After it was, after it was all over, the forestry crew told us that if we had not shown up with what we had, it could have been a different story. We were in good spirits as we were successful in dis extinguishing that fire quickly. And the overall feeling was one of accomplishment accomplishment and camaraderie, camaraderie with the excellent teamwork done by all. So the day started with a discussion of the grass fire and our response to it. The last task at the end of the day was to fill our water tanks on the work trucks so that we were ready for the next fire. We agreed during the, we agreed during the meeting that a faster response can make a difference. Hop in and go. So here, Lytton, the Lytton fire on June 30th was roughly started around 4.20 p.m. and was pretty well done by 5.20. So 90% of the Lytton village was destroyed in adjacent elephant reserves. 39 band structures were lost on IR 17, 18, and 22. All communication with Lytton area was lost on June 30th by 5.20 p.m. Telus had a hub set up on, by July 3rd with limited range, maybe about a kilometer. It estimated up to 400 people displaced from Lytton First Nation due to evacuations of the Lytton area. Some people have been displaced for up to 15 months and still to this day. I believe there's one or two still out there. Uh, people were evacuated to Lillewitt, Boston Bar, Hope, Cash Creek, Merritt, Kamloops, Chilliwack, Abbotsford, and Langley. So it was just after four o'clock. I told the crew that we can go home early 
that day because it was hot. 51 degrees Celsius is what my truck was saying. And after multiple days of working in it, we felt like it was well deserved that we can leave a few minutes early. We had done our usual end of the day discussions, which consisted mostly of our day off plans, then left for the day. On my way home, I had to I have to drive through town, and as I passed the grocery store, I happened to look at my clock and temperature gauge. It was showing 52 degrees Celsius Celsius at 4:20. That's when I saw some smoke. But by the time I arrived home, said hello to my family. Seeing the finishing touches were being done for dinner, then my phone rings. It was my coworker telling me that the Litton, that Litton was on fire, get my family out and go grab one of our water trucks to help. He was already responding to the fire in one of our in our large truck with the 800 gallon water tank, pump and hose. I was not immediately panicked by that. I told the girls about the call as I was getting my shoes on and grabbing my work keys again. Told them I would update them on what was going on. I left around 4.32 for, for our office. So driving back down the hill to town, flames had come up the hill and had reached the CP rail underpass, which when I drove through was already thick with heavy smoke. More shocking was, as I drove through town, people seemed to be going about their normal lives, not knowing the danger that was approaching and extremely fast. As I arrived back at our office at St. George's Road, another coworker was just arriving as I was, and we went into the office, grabbed the truck keys for our two water trucks, tossed one set of keys to my coworker, and told him to follow me. Litton was starting to burn, I said. We were going down to Mile Hill towards town, so that in the picture here on the left-hand side, that was us going downtown. That was our site. And from that part of the road, you had a good look at all of Litton. We can see the black and gray smoke traveling up through town from the south end to the north, we enter town off the bridge. I can see people and vehicles all over the place, running and driving in panic. I got on our truck radio and told my coworker to try and stay close to me because the smoke was thick in town. I was barely able to see 10 feet past the front of my truck. I told him to watch out for pedestrians and vehicles. Two other coworkers, one who was on the Lytton Volunteer Fire Department, got on the radio, say, got on the radio saying that they were on Fraser Street trying to protect some homes from the flames. I informed them that we were going to the south end of town with our trucks. The homes that they worked on to protect, they're still standing there today. When we reached the very south end of town, we parked our trucks where we felt it was safe distance and upwind from the flames. We both quickly jumped out of our trucks, started unrolling our hoses, installing nozzles, and started our water pumps. I heard on the radio that there was no more water in the hydrants. So we had no other backup water. With the, fire, with the fire spreading so fast, firefighters were spread out as well, using whatever they can to battle a blaze. I had gotten within 60 feet of a home on, a, on fire. That was it. The heat from that building was crazy. We sprayed water on one structure for a bit, and after seeing that it was a lost cause, we diverted to the village O&M building, just down a small hill from where we parked. We can hear multiple explosions of vehicles that were parked down by the CN Bridge. This was during high water and the local ferry service was closed. The people parked down near the CN Bridge, the people parked down near the CN Bridge so they could walk across the footbridge to the west side to their waiting second vehicles. And that's what happens when there's high water in Lytton. The ferry has to close and people are using the CN Bridge to get to the west side to their homes. So I went down, sprayed on the o &M building, about 25 feet away, which was about 25 feet away, and then onto a tree about 20 feet away because it was it was on fire with, but the water I sprayed I sprayed on it had no very little effect to it because it was so hot. A few explosions from the o &M building that caused the roof to blow out on the far end caused me to back up a few feet, and as I was trying to work my hose back. The smoke cleared a bit, and in the parking lot next to the o &M building was a large 1,000-gallon fuel tank. The flames off that building was reaching towards that tank along with the heat. I dropped my hose and then ran back up the hill to the trucks. I told my co-workers co-worker about the tank. We dragged the hoses up the hill and then moved our trucks about 20 feet further away. I tore a hole in two lines from dragging the hose over the ground and across some broken bottles that I didn't see.
We continue to spray both buildings again best we can. The electrical lines of the first home that, were, that we were spraying fell to the ground, causing sparks to shoot in all directions. I yelled to my coworker that we have to move our trucks further back again. After the second move, I was starting to grab the hose again when I noticed a van trying to come down the hill into town. I had to run out waving my arms for them to stop, telling them to turn around because the power lines were across the road. And I did the same for a truck that came down shortly after. Standing next to my coworker as we tried to spray the Lytton Village O&M building, I said to him as we looked towards the downtown area that was blocked in with dark, blocked in with dark shades of black and gray smoke, helicopters dropping water in different locations. Man, Lytton's gone. I hope everyone, everyone makes it out. My coworker looked at me and said, Warren, I have to go see, my, see if my family is safe. Okay, after we finish these tanks of water, you can go to your family. I'm gonna try and go for another load and see if I can do anything else, I told them. Just as our tanks emptied, the hydro lines connected to the home fell to the ground, sparked up as the cable, as the cable wound itself up. After that, we dropped our hoses, ran to our trucks, disconnected the lines and drove up the highway because we were not able to go through town anymore. This is about five o'clock. I radioed our actions in case our coworkers were listening and our coworkers came on saying they were moving the truck to the, to the gas station to try and protect it and its fuel tanks. We reached the top and turned onto the highway, seeing the crowd of people, their vehicles, emergency vehicles and road traffic on the turn off to Ponderosa all watching the fires, watching us as we drove by. We drove past Lytton First Nation Reserve IR number 17, which is on the other side of the highway above Lytton. Noticing the flames on some of the homes there too, crazy how far the fire has spread in such a short time. We had gotten to the north entrance of Lytton that takes us through IR 18 and to the bridge that crosses the Thompson River onto Highway 12. Driving through, we noticed the fires were already halfway through IR 18 people running, loading vehicles, the one-way traffic as we drove through. I told my co-worker to park the truck at the top of St. George's Road and leave the keys in it and go, to, go find his family. I was going for another load. I drove up Alkali Road to where we had a water stand pipe that we use for supplying firefighting water from a pond just further up the road. I filled my tank then spoke on the radio that I was re refilling and heading back. My co-workers who was at the gas station got on again and said they were leaving the truck at the gas station as it was acting up due to all the smoke and he was leaving it and he was leaving to load his family and camper and evacuate. All I could say was okay, drive safe. I grabbed my cell phone to message my wife that I was okay to see how they were doing. No cell signal, no Wi-Fi, only our truck radios but there was no one else to communicate with in our trucks. By the time I got back to the gas station, there was a roadblock set up to prevent, to prevent anyone from entering. I turned around and headed back to Two Mile. There I met up with some locals and told them that Lytton was on fire and pretty much gone and the road was all blocked. I told them that we should start telling everybody door to door to start evacuating all of our reserves in that area. I had heard from someone that the evacuation muster location was going to be the Stein Valley School, and that's where I was sending everyone. I drove through Two Mile, honking my horn and yelling to everyone to start evacuating, moved to Three Mile and Four Mile. Then I went to back. Then I went back to St. George's Road again to start going down to warn people. I noticed vehicles leaving from that area. I asked what was happening, and someone said the evacuation point is now Lillooet. So I went down St. George's to make sure everyone was leaving. I saw an elderly couple who looked unsure of what was happening and, look, and looking for some direction. I yelled at them, what are you doing? Pack up and get out. Lytton's on fire and might be coming this way next, fast. They hustled pretty good, pretty quick after that. I saw one of my uncle's family all, all trying to load as much as they can into several vehicles. I yelled at them to get going and, and that the fire was moving fast and Lytton is gone, this area might be next. I went, to back, I went back to the top of St. George's Road to start directing everyone who I told prior about Stein Valley School being the evacuation point, to start heading them to Lillooet and to the rec center there. Uh, several people stopped 
asking about what was going on. Are all the reserves evacuated? Where is so-and-so? I tried to answer them as best I knew, but tried to maintain the urgency for them to start going to Lillooet. One lady parked her car next to us saying, she does not have enough fuel to make it to Lillooet. Not sure what happened with her, but it wasn't until much later that I noticed her car was gone. Excuse me. Okay, next slide is a tough one for me to get through. <laughs> so it was not until one of my aunts stopped and asked me where my family was. I don't know. No cell service, no phone service. And unable to go through Lytton anymore. I didn't know. I looked at her, kept my posture and said, I don't know. She said she'll try to find out for me and find out for me when she gets a little bit. After that, I took a moment, covered my head and bent over because my body started to ache from not knowing where my family was. But about 20 minutes later, my aunt returned to tell me that she managed to contact my wife who told her everyone was safe and my aunt told her the same of me. That was really that's my toughest slide. <laughs> so July 1st, the next day, no sleep the first night. RCMP had a vehicle that blocking the road. Another RCMP, RCMP vehicle was going back and forth doing patrols. One person showed up. They had woken up at a friend's place and wanted to keep going home after we stopped them. They never knew the town had burned. So after things had settled, I parked my truck at the junction of Highway 12 and St. George's Road, along with a few other locals, including our intern Lytton First Nation chief. The, vol the volunteer fire truck stopped in as well. I and a coworker went to the shop to pick up the other water truck and have it sit with us by the road. We were standing watch to make sure the fire did not jump over the highway, did not jump over Highway 12 to the riverside of the road where the number of our where a number of our evacuated reserves sat, which never happened, thank goodness. But it was around 6.45 by that time. A few, forest, a few forestry personnel showed up to ask how we were doing and if we had any updates on the evacuation. One of them asked about our first aid supplies, which was only basics. He suggested we go and check buildings and start gathering all of our medical supplies we can find in preparation of a, of a possible mass casualty event due to the fire. By this time, we had noticed there was no power, which was expected. After returning with the first aid supplies, we noted, noticed that the forestry crew was helping an elderly gentleman who was found in the middle of the elementary field. He was hiding behind a, a steel container in, in the middle of the field as the flames blew past him. He was very dehydrated, weak and dirty from the smoke and ashes that was flowing around him. He got a ride to medical aid with a BC ambulance vehicle that was not an ambulance. So just a medic's personal truck that was parked there. Uh, later, we also heard on the forestry radio, they were looking for someone who spoke French. A person was found by the crews walking down the Botany Valley while it was burning. He was taken to aid by someone somewhere. Uh, we weren't sure where he ended up, but he was walking in the middle of the Botany Valley Road, which was basically burning on both sides of the the dirt road that he was walking down and he was slowly being baked. So around eight o'clock, I asked the forestry crew if it would be okay to go to the gas station to grab our large water truck that was abandoned down there. We went, the drive down the hill was tough to see the town of Lytton as nothing but glowing embers and small fires remaining. The CN bridge that crosses the Thompson River because of its curves was like a long serpent stretching across the river and on fire. We checked with crews nearby to see if they needed the truck and its water before we left with it. We went and filled the large truck with water and parked it with us at the top of St. George's Road with our other water trucks and fire truck. <laughs> Around 10 o'clock, 10 p.m., a call came in over the fire truck's radio. The YRB Highways Department was asking if someone can go to the ferry and look for a worker who was not answering any calls due to no landlines or cell service. They were unable to do so because there was no access through town. Lytton was isolated from all three highway entrances into town as a result of the fire. 
I volunteered to go down and look for him. Arrived at the ferry, grabbed the flashlight, yelled about, no answer, checked the trailer that was parked there for the workers' quarters, I believe, then went to the ferry itself. Walked across the, some boards they had laid out that allowed the, board, the boarding of workers on the ferry while it's anchored during the high water. Nobody found. I looked towards town to see the devastation, took a picture of my phone, which I sent to my wife later, and returned to our home, homemade checkpoint, to report my findings. So I drove to the transfer station a couple of kilometers from the checkpoint because we were told there was, a, there was some, cell, some cell signal there to contact my family and friends to let them know we were okay. Once there, I found a signal. My phone erupted in texts and missed calls. So about, 05, about five o'clock in the morning, July 1st, one of the forestry commanders asked about some of the back roads and where they led. I asked if he wanted to go for a drive and I can try and try to inform him the best I can of all the back roads in the area. At one point, we, we were right in the path of the fire, like a wall that pushed and cleared its way wherever, wherever it pleased. I pointed out the standpipe that we used to fill our water tanks with raw water for firefighting. He made note of that. He then asked about our fire hydrants. I told him they were useless as a lot of our members left their homes with sprinklers on to try and save their homes, but that depleted our already low reservoirs from the high usage and no power to run the pumps that, re that refill the water reservoirs. Is it the slide you want to be at? Uh, no, next one. Uh, where was I? The road was too rough. Uh, this was because their water tenders had not arrived yet. We'd done a few loads there, and then we were asked to haul water to another bladder at the top of Quinn Road. That was roughly above the Botany Road. The road was too rough for the large water tenders to drive up, but our 4x4 trucks were perfect for the narrow single wide road. We filled up at the standpipe with our water and drove the loads up that road all day, a few times coming across oncoming forestry vehicles and having to back up a distance to a wide spot for two vehicles to pass each other. During that time, forestry was setting up a fire guard to protect all of our reserves along the Highway 12. It was amazing to see them roll out kilometers of poles along the highway and the large bladders in certain key areas, maybe six altogether. With all the hoses laid out, they had hoses going to our standpipe with the help of a pump, filled all the bladders and the hose along the highway. Amazing. I've never seen this before. This whole time I had my coworker, this whole time I and my coworker had been getting bottled water from random people, along with a few bags of chips and fruit. We would sneak into the forestry crew's lunch truck to grab a few granola bars and sports drinks so we can keep somewhat fed and hydrated in the heat. Uh, our trucks had nothing. We had three water three water trucks and two drivers, myself and the coworker. We ran the one tons mostly and a few loads on the big truck. I was also in contact with ComCom Services, a local engineering firm in Lytton, who managed to contact me saying they have a lead on the generator for our Stein water system. I arranged with our leadership to get them on the access list for the area so they can get through the roadblocks with the donated generator. So sometime during the day on the 1st, the local fire chief for the village of Lytton Volunteer Fire Department, he showed up in the rescue truck. He gave us updates as to what was happening in the area, where the checkpoints were set up and the locations of the evacuation centers that were set up by the neighboring bands. By 7, 7 p.m., we told forestry that we were done it was time for us to leave and be with our families to let them know we were okay. We called the volunteer fire, ch fire chief to give us an escort through the roadblocks so we can get on our way. So the next few days were spent traveling through the ravaged Lytton area, the roadblocks, meeting and talking with people from several agencies and tailgate-like meetings in places wherever they caught up to me. The cell signal was out in the general area of Lytton, but if you drove a few kilometers in either, either highway, you were able to get some signal. 
our radios were only programmed to our band signal. That allowed us to communicate with each other, but no other agency. We were in a mandatory evacuation zone. There was nobody to save us if we got into serious trouble. We constantly reminded ourselves on that. So after two nights with our families, we came back to do a quick assessment of what we had left in our community. Uh, was going around shutting off curb valves to the homes so we can isolate them off and restart the water system for the village of Lytton. Uh, isolated a burnt out well. This is well number three that also assisted the Lytton water system with water. We had to isolate that so we didn't contaminate the water source for the village of Lytton. So here's the donated generator that we received from Answer Power Systems, I believe it's called. They're out of Abbotsford. So we set this up at our, in, on our Stein water system, our largest system. It's a slow sand filtration system. So the Stein water system, it's surface water. It come, the water comes from the Stein River. We have two slow sand filters, has three lift stations, there's two pumps in each lift station, six water storage structures, and about 160,000 imperial, ga imperial gallons of water storage. There's 150 residential connections, including the 22 unit seniors complex, a west side of a hall, a health center, and one school. That's, that was everything that was on the Stein system in 2021. So through July 1st, to the 9th. Plans were already started on July 1st. ComCom Services or ComCom Services LittonNet had already been, been in contact with a company willing to donate a generator. Two more generators were, were rented and they were all connected and they were all connected to each station. So we have three stations on the Stein water system, uh, what we call Booster 1 by the creek. Booster 2 is our main filtration treatment center and booster three is a lift station to our reservoirs. So after a bit, we got them all connected with generators. Uh, one, generator had, one generator had to be driven around through Lillooet and back down via the North Spencer Road, then connected to booster one lift station. This travel is an estimated 140 kilometers. Initially, a plan was thought of to pull the breakers on the hydro poles within a certain area around our booster one and two stations. This would power up the two stations and a few homes within the section of hydro lines. It would have worked, but we chose not to do it as it may damage the home, damage home appliances because of the dirty power of the generator. We waited for the other two generators to arrive before we started charging up any water system. So it's just some of the ideas we came up with that we didn't follow through on because we thought a little further along. Uh, another reason why we wanted to get water moving, not just to supply water to the fire hydrants, but in the Stein system, other than trying to charge our fire hydrants to help supply water for the firefight, uh, I wasn't sure how long could our, our sand sit with stagnant water before that stagnant water starts to affect the quality of the sand, uh, the properties of the filter sand. Uh, I couldn't find an answer on that. So I was really hoping to get the water moving through the sand so we wouldn't have to wait weeks or months for a new ship in the sand to be brought in. Uh, that was one of the key reasons I wanted to get things moving at the slow sand filtration plant. So with the help of ComCom Services LittonNet and our local electrician, of, local electrician of Lauren Electric, we managed to get the Stein water system operating in hand mode with three generators by July 9th. To operate the system, it included a lot of running in between the three systems, two of which were on the west side and one on the east side of the Fraser River. Because we could not have any automatic controls, they were all operated in hand and one system at a time. There was a truck available, each, available on each side of the Fraser River for travel, 
and we use the Stein Water Bridge that crosses over the Fraser River by foot between boosters one and three, with booster two in the middle. The distance is an, is an estimated six kilometers. Regardless of the water treatment, this system was on a do not consume. It was filled to charge the fire hydrants of the communities that were still in danger from the fire. It gave us a chance to defend our remaining reserves. So booster one, two, and three of the side water system. Booster one supplies water to booster two to be treated. Booster two will send water up to booster three, and then from there it gets sent to our two reservoirs and back to another reservoir on the west side. Kind of confusing. But the way we, the, the system that we came up with with the generators was, we start the generator up at booster three, we empty the gen empty out booster three of all its treated water into our, our reservoirs. We'll shut the system down there, go across the river to booster two, start the generator up there, start, start the pumps up and start pumping water up to booster three. And then we'll open up the, 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 uh, the filter cells and we'll start running water through the slow sand filtration cells. So it, it was being partially treated, but we didn't treat with chlorination. So there we moved the water through the, fill, through the slow sand to fill up the clear wells again. And once we ran out of water there, or when we ran out of water to treat, we turned everything off there, went down to booster one, which is next to the creek. We turned the generator there, turned on the generator and the pumps, and that pumped fresh raw water up to booster two to be treated. So then we shut shut that off, go back to booster two, start that up, and yeah, just starting the process all the way through. So we did that for the 14 days that, or not the 14 days, but maybe the six days or so while we were running the system off of generators uh, was quite the quite the ordeal for sure. Here we are setting up for the generators at booster two and booster three. Andrew there hooking it all up. We didn't have a quick disconnect set up for generators on any of our systems. So this is how we were doing everything. Everything was done by hand. So here is uh, the Nikaya water system. So uh, the Nikaya water system is a surface water. It gets its water from Nikaya Creek, has spin filters, bag filters, cartridge filters, UV and chlorination. Two 5,000 gallon fiberglass reservoirs that, dis that, that distributes to seven residential connections. So this system had no power as well due to the Litton fire. To bypass this system and to get water into the reservoir, we connected a six inch pipe end cap with an inch and a half female threaded hole in it and connected it onto the raw water flush out line that drains into a ditch line. Then we connected an inch and a half forestry fire hose, connected the gate valve onto the cap and connected a hundred foot fire hose to it. That was kind of confusing. Okay, we hooked up a, a valve and hooked the fire hose onto that valve, hundred foot fire hose. We opened the drain valve filling the reservoir with raw water. The gravity pressure was just enough for the water to enter the reservoir, but not enough to cause the hose to spray out itself. You know, how when you dangle something in, if it's got too much pressure, it'll whip itself out. But there was just enough pressure to, that it wouldn't do that. But we tied it up anyway, just to make sure it didn't fall out. This took about half a day to fill, and then the overflow, it just poured back into the ditch when the reservoirs overflowed. The residents that stayed behind were all informed that they they were on the boil advisory. There, there were some people still living their homes on this system. So thinking outside the box, here we have our, what's called a water system, IR910. This water system gets its water from the Napuchin Creek. The intake leads to the wet well. Is the intake leading to the wet well 
that's chlorinated, then pumped to a 10,000 gallon fiberglass reservoir, and then distributed to six residential connections. So this system had no power as well. This system is an estimate is estimated about 10 kilometers up North Spencer Road from Lytton Ferry. The fire had jumped the Fraser, Jill, Fraser River July 3rd evening. Local members and staff of ComCom services responded to that. Responded to the fire to start fighting that fire. Shortly after, shortly after forestry showed up. With no power to our water plant and a fair distance between the fire and a water source, the solution was to disconnect the pipe, the two system pumps from the piping, connect two forestry fire hoses fitting onto the pipe ends and connect them to the Wayjack pumps. Raw water was pumped to the reservoir using both forestry pumps, thus charging the fire hydrants for forestry to feed off of them. This system was also put on a boil advisory for the remaining members that stayed behind. After the fire emergency had passed, we continued to use the fire pumps daily to keep the reservoir filled. The pumps were fired up in the morning and late afternoon for a few hours, and the reservoir monitor monitored visually during the day. This had gone on until power was restored July 15th. Due to the pump's coarse screens, minor debris made its way into the lines, and over time, the debris acted like a sandblaster wearing a hole in the fitting in the distribution line. This was discovered a few days after the power was restored. On July 28th, the distribution line was dug up, the cause of the leak found and repaired with the new fitting. The system was back to normal operations. I don't have a picture of it, but we also have another system, the Kitsuit water system, which is just on the highway, highway number one on the south end of Lytton. Kitsuit water system, it's also surface water. It gets this water from the Sawmill Creek. It goes through a coarse and fine stainless steel filter screens. It's a gravity fed system. Water is chlorinated as it enters the clear well or reservoir and then distributed to seven residential connections. So on July 3rd, after the access through roadblocks was sorted, we started to gather parts for the Kitsuit water system. The system has a solenoid controlled valve that opens and closes as water is needed because there is no power. We started to connect the hose to the raw water bypass line and attach it to a ladder rung in the reservoir. The plan was to open the bypass and fill the reservoir with raw water again, just to charge the fire hydrants. As we were clamping down the hose going into the reservoir, power was restored. Power was restored as far as the highway buildings, as, as far as the highway building about two kilometers south from the village of Lytton. The hose was removed and the system was set up for normal operation, but it was put on a do not consume as we were not certain of the damages to the water source shed because this system was still being affected by the George Road fire at the time. August 15th, this system was connected in the same way again in preparation of filling fire trucks that were protecting the Siska and Shkapa, protecting the Siska and Shkapa bands. They were about 11 kilometers south from Lytton. Their system was being, their systems were being used to fill the water bladders for the for, for forestry, but they were not able to keep up or recover their water levels fast enough for their efforts. So we had the Kitsuit system set up to feed the fire trucks that were helping out those reserves. And we told them that we'll have endless amounts of water for them if they, if they have to fill up there. I think they only took a few loads out, but it was there. And that came up in a recent meeting this year as to reliable water sources. And the Kitsuit water system is the one I've pointed out as having a, a good reliable water system. And it's right on the highway. If need be, we can probably run a water line right down to the road and start filling trucks right off the highway. Uh, the other one not pictured are, is a well system, groundwater. It's on the Pepium. So this one has no treatment. It's a 336 foot deep well. Pumps, the water is pumped through the distribution lines and into the reservoir. It's a 10,000 gallon steel cylinder tank. And then it's distributed to 10 residential connections. So July 9th, 
we finally managed to hook up our largest portable generator to the Pepium well system. We were able to wait a few days before working on this system because we knew the water usage was low on, on, their, on this reserve and they would have water for a few days after the power outage. So we hooked up our 10,000 watt generator to the well. The breaker had to be reset a few times during the day on the generator with visual checks of the reservoir. Running the system was done every second day just because of their low water use. There was no boil advisor put on the system as we had, we had done nothing to it other than connect the generator. So the people were still able to drink the water normally. Making the repairs. All of these systems ran the way they were set up that I showed in the, the past few slides up until July 15th when hydro was fully restored to the entire area. The next three days after, we, we spent draining and cleaning all the reservoirs and then flushing the mains. Water samples were taken and tested. After two negative results of the samples, the boil advisory, advisories were removed. And I would put notices out about that. So here Brian is fixing the broken water line that was at Nakaith water system that where we blew a hole with, this, with the gravel. And there Dion is cleaning a reservoir in one of the science system reservoirs. Uh, but yeah, it took us three days after everything was settled. There was no rush because there was technically no people in the area. So we had we were casually somewhat cleaning systems the best we can. But again, we had uh, makeshift safety protocols that we developed between ourselves to keep ourselves safe because again we were in an area that there was no help for us if we, if we got into trouble. So after the power was on we started cleaning up everything, pulling out the power, power lines and pulling generators away, again cleaning the systems. So the sights and sounds never forgotten. For me, the sound of the wind, crackling of all the burning bushes, helicopters flying overhead, multiple explosions from vehicles and structure fires all together just sound like a battle scene. The heat in the wind was like standing in front of a large hairdryer set on high. The embers flying up from below where the fire started was landing on us as we sprayed water, and that mixed with the heat and wind was burning our arms. We only had our normal t-shirts and a safety vest, no long sleeves as we are not firefighters. The flames coming off of the house that was shooting, the flames coming off of one house was shooting horizontally, like 20 to 30 feet, 20 to 30 feet out. We were spraying maybe 30 to 40 feet upwind from that house just to make sure the water was gonna hit that structure. Versus if we were trying to spray directly in front of the house. We tried that and the water was literally going sideways, hitting the, the ground beside the house and not the home itself. This is all from the result of the wind. When the power lines fell from the home, it was alarming to see the bright white spots of light arc off the ground like watching a group of welders welding all at once. It was kind of a before and after. I tried to get a picture of where we set up initially and this is how it looks today. As I mentioned, we went from the Litton, Litton Creek fires into the November 2021 floods. These are the bridges and underpass passes on the highway, number one highway. As you can see, the, this is the Hank Hill underpass. It's all standing on its legs and everything else. That, yeah, everything was undermined, just crazy. Uh, these pictures I had taken off from other other sites uh, some of my friends had posted and wow. So during the, the November floods, uh, November 14th is when the heavy rain started and this is our Nakaya Creek. Nakaya, Nakaya Creek has six homes I believe. I think nine homes were isolated as a result of this flooding for Nakaya Creek. 
So this work here took us four days to repair after everything calmed down. So we started work on the 15th afternoon. So by the 20th, we were done. All we had was our 303 excavator, our 307 excavator, a backhoe and a dump truck and a small skid steer. So here's kind of like the end of our work after four days. So once we were done this one in four days, we went further down and came to the next one, which is Qualinac Creek. So Qualinac Creek took eight days for this one to repair. So on the other side of this road, we had a elderly couple that was stranded and their mobility wasn't very good. So I think around day six or seven on this project, uh, a call came out that one of them was having medical distress, so we cranked up our our work and got the job done just enough for a four by four to get through to pick up the elders and bring them back to the waiting ambulance. So yeah, eight days to do this work again with with the same pieces of equipment. Uh, one thing to note: CN Rail actually had a large a larger excavator close by, and they sent it up to help us and we use them to create a whole bunch of uh, fill material for us. So they basically basically dug out a corner for us and turned it all into fill material. And that machine for its four hours of work probably saved us a good two days with our equipment doing that, doing that same work. So from the November floods, we go into the 21 winter snow. In the picture, this is the West Side Road or North Spencer Road, somewhere is up, up North Spencer Road. It's 40 kilometers of dirt road with uh, cell radio dead spots along the way. Uh, our radios can only go so far. Uh, cell service works only about 12 kilometers up the river from Lytton. But during the heavy snowfall, nobody was allowed to plow upriver due to the dangers of avalanche risk to the operator's safety. So we waited until the snow stopped and it seemed safer. And then we sent three operators on plows and heavy equipment. It took them about three days to reach the farthest reserve that we had on that road. So mid-December, new backhoes came in. It could have helped us with the snow, but we didn't have tire chains for them. So we had another week's wait or tire chains to come in. Uh, these were purchased mainly because my leadership was tired of us telling them that, I'm sorry, we can't use this machine, it's broken down. I'm sorry, we can't use that, it's broken down. Uh, we're waiting to get it fixed. It's being fixed, we're waiting for parts. So the leadership decided that we had to go out and buy some new equipment. And yeah, here's one of two new, new machines that we got and they had been very helpful as of late. The Lytton First Nation starts bringing people home. So here in the picture is our battlefield temporary homes. I believe there are six, 15 homes on this site. So the work started in Lytton to make changes and improvements to accommodate to all of this new, the new homes and temporary uh, structures that were coming in. So our department installed 31 septic fields for the temporary homes. Temporary trailer parks with water and septic connections developed a gravel pit supplying Lytton First Nation, the Lytton Recovery, and highway surrounding projects. Here we are improving our infrastructure, making improvements so we can accommodate the, the new homes that you saw in the last slide. Uh, this slide just shows what we were driving through for a couple of, well, basically months. This is my site going through town every day. Here's the gravel pit. So this gravel pit, like I was saying, we supply 
they were supplying materials to fill in the empty voids of the homes on the village of Lytton and IR 18 and 17. And also just to top the ground overall after they removed all the burnt debris and contaminated soils. So this is something that Lytton First Nation started up after that because we knew that was coming and there would be a need. Uh, here's one of the trailer parks that we have and we're looking to expand on expand to another one just across the road from this section here. We're going to be putting in another one to accommodate some of the workers and other staff that will be coming in as we start the reconstruction in, in the village of Lytton and on our reserves. So while we got this, so we got this all up and going and then the Nohomeen fire started the very next year. Uh, the call came in 1245, was July, five minutes, July 14th. Uh, this fire, when we responded, uh, I had two, two life scares myself in that time. The first place we responded to, we're trying to see if there was any family left in the houses. The daughter was out telling us their her parents were around the house, in the houses. We went in, got surrounded by smoke. I panicked because my partner, who's a firefighter, he left the truck to walk further in because it was too smoky for the truck. But I, I sort of panicked. Looked out the window, I saw the fire, started getting my fire gear, fire hose and everything all ready. And by the time I had it ready, the fire was on me. I had no time to start the pumps up, just jumped in the truck and moved the truck. Started up the pump again, and by that time, my partner showed up. Oh. So once we did, once we did that, um, went back to where the fire started, where we thought the house was burned down, but we noticed the house is still standing. We went up, started working to save that house. We were running loads of water back and forth, and in one of those times, we were defending the house. We I got surrounded by smoke again, and I was manning the water pumps because I was cramping up from, well, just cramps, because it was hot and I was thirsty. Uh, cramping up, the smoke had surrounded us again, and I thought we were surrounded by fire. I looked at the water truck and saw there was maybe a foot of water left in the bottom of that tank. I shut the pump off. My partner had come running around the corner from the building, and he's like, hey, what's happening? Are we out of water? I said, no, I think we're surrounded by fire. This is all the fire we have left. So my plan is we'll have to douse ourselves and basically run down that road where all the smoke is and hopefully we survive. But once the smoke cleared up, we were still okay. So I was, I, I panicked, but hey, who doesn't panic in that? <laughs> but we hauled the water for hours to save the one home I thought was first lost. So we tried to leave around so here we are loading water up to try and save the house. Uh, this became kind of like a forestry uh, area to get together and do their planning. So here, we tried to leave this fire at around 11.30, but we had to protect our water system first. So here we are trying to protect the water system. The pumps started acting up and that was the best pressure we could get. So we ended up putting that fire out with that much water. It took a little longer, but we got it. And to help protect the water system, this is our Stein water system here. We took a backhoe that was parked there and just scraped the dirt guard around it. Cause this was 1130 at night we were tired. We scraped the guard and we just said, that's good enough, uh, let's, let's go home. So during the Nohomeen fire, construction crews and helicopter and the helicopter helped with the, gen, with the generator placements. This helped us get the water moving within a day. And here's a picture of some locals that had their own tanks and pumps. They were running around helping out wherever they could and protecting their own property. So here we have a generator set up at Nakaya. Uh, forestry crew somewhere on the west side road 
with the water bladder, they had bladder set up in key areas. And here we have finally our new trucks arrived. So two months after ordering the trucks, they finally arrived. It was just near the end of the fire season for us. They're now outfitted with snow plow controls, and we also have a spare 225 gallon tank and pump to load if needed. And shortly after the trucks came in, two new trailers, our, our two new water trailers arrived. This took seven to eight months after we ordered it, and they too arrived just after the fire. We tested it shortly after because we had to respond to a grass fire and our response time with the trailer was way quicker. Uh, one unit is kept on each side of the river, so we have one, one trailer on the east side and one trailer on the west side to stand by. So during the summer, they are kept full. So here, Stein Mountain Fire. That started up late July, or early August. Uh, August 22nd, that the red picture, that's one of my operators. They're defending, they're trying to put out the fire because another operator's house is on the back side of that picture. If you can imagine maybe 200 feet further up the road or so is my operator's home. And they were they were there till five o'clock in the morning making sure the fire didn't crawl under his house. So during that fire, August uh, 6th and, I think August 6th and 7th, we had like a one night rain event and Nine Mile Creek gave up. So here the Nine Mile Creek washed out. The excavator that you see in the picture, they were actually there to, they were actually supposed to go up this day to go put a fire guard around Brian's house. But instead he was helping us with this washout, which was greatly appreciated. So nine hours, after nine hours, this is what we got. It helped uh, with the help of that forestry excavator. 11 Mile, another washout closer to Brian's place. Uh, this was cleared up in the in the same day as well, no problem there. Steel roofing, hardy board siding is the way that we're we're looking at going. We're looking at more fire resistant roofing materials for sure. Steel being one of them, and some of the new asphalt single shingling. But yeah, we're we're changing our building materials as something more robust to, to heat and a lot of the and like a, like a lot of other, other places we're getting rid of the trees and shrubs and whatnot so here's what well number three looks like today the one that got burned up so that's what it looks like today and this is what it looked like july 1st after the fire So new flat decks finally arrived. We ordered these trucks and it took about eight months for them to get in. Uh, eight months from the order, the delivery and finally getting a deck installed. That's what it took to get these trucks to where they are now, eight months. I know a lot of our, a, a lot of our waiting for equipment was a result of all the, the COVID and the, the issues at the processing plants or the construction plants or whatever. So the, this truck, these two trucks are always loaded up with uh, 225 gallon water tanks, pump and fire gear. So the water quality, like I said in some of the other slides, during all of these emergencies, all the water systems were under boil advisory until we started our sampling again. The main purpose was just to get our hydrants back online in hopes of saving what we had left. So we weren't worried about the about people drinking the water. We just wanted to protect the homes so they had a home to go back to and they can get some water. Uh, we developed new procedures on the fly for, for all the temporary measures. So when I was talking about the Stein water system, what we had to do there to get water moving, uh, the Nakaya water system, the seven mile water system that's in the picture here, the one that was hooked up with fire pumps. 
yeah, those are all new plans that we we are putting into our emergency response plans. So in 2021, it took us three days to get water moving with generators. That was on our smaller systems, but it took the nine days on the Stein system. In 2022, we had moving we had water moving by the next day with generators, and that's because we had the construction companies help us fly the generators on site and whatnot. But we also took the initiative of renting generators when the fire started up because we knew the fire was going to affect the power. So we actually started calling when the fire started to have the generators on standby. So that was another time saver there. So by using all these past skills in 2023, when they had to take the power out for a, a, a section of uh, power lines where the fire, where the Stein Mountain fire was located, we had a generator hooked up to the seven mile water system again that same day because we had generators rented and parked on standby, waiting to be used if we, if we needed. So here's Lytton First Nations water team during all the fires. Uh, Andrew Loring, Loring Electric, he helped us with the connections of the generators, uh, electrical, anything electrical he helped. There was myself, Dion Moody, he's a certified small water system operator, a rope with uh, septic, or septic installs, and he's a volunteer fire department. Brian Phillips, he's my main water guy. He's a water treatment level one, water distribution one, small waste water systems, and small water systems. He's my right-hand guy for the water. Daniel Mundell of ComCom Services or LittonNet, he's not in the picture, but he was very beneficial very, very helpful in information and he's just an all around good guy and very knowledgeable, knew a lot of stuff and fast thinking on his feet, which helped us in a, a few tight spots for sure. So the, us four, we were always the four that stuck behind on all three of these fires and we did what we could to get things moving. And by the third, by the third time we got together, we pretty well knew each other's moves. So. We, we moved fairly quick. Here's all the services and agencies that helped with the disaster recovery. So days during the disaster, we had Lytton Volunteer Fire Department, Lytton First Nation o &M Department, BC Wildfire Service, the locals, local highway department, VSA, the RCMP, ComCom Services, Denton Matcon Construction Companies. So during the recovery period, we've got EMVC, Red Cross, Lytton First Nation, First Nation Emergency Services, Indigenous Services Canada, EMAP, Emergency something, I can't remember what that is, Interior Health, Urban Systems, the SPCA, ESS, FNHA, Cala Sciences, Dent Construction, CNR Rail, Samaritan's Purse, IBI, IBI Group, Ford Modular Steel River, Camp Hope, BC Hydro, TELUS, Lauren Electric, Rubicon, Litton Volunteer Fire Department, MATCON, and other groups or agencies that I may have forgotten. So shout out to these groups. I've got Daniel Mundell and John Mundell of ComCom LittonNet, and Reza and Hamed of Aqua Intelligent. So in late 2020, Aqua Intelligent installed their monitoring equipment and they were helped by ComCom LittonNet services for installing the Wi-Fi signal to get Aqua Intelligence monitoring equipment up and running. So these systems were installed at the 18 and 25 mile water systems, which is our farthest systems towards Lillooet on the North Spencer Road. So they're monitoring system it is an app that is installed that is installed on our operators phones having this app installed on these two devices saved us a lot of time and uh, uh, yeah saved us a lot of time because we didn't have to send an operator an hour and a half up one way to check to see if the systems were fine he was able to open his phone look at his phone and say the waters are good Warren I can stay here and help rather than that operator disappearing for three hours and just to say everything's fine. Yeah, so having that 
monitoring system on those part of the systems help a lot. So Litton in the recovery and pushing forward. So how and where are we now? Essential, service, essential services have returned. Mental health and wellness is available and ongoing. Schools are back in session. Workers returning to their offices. Celebrations, events, planning, and celebrations and events are planning are being planned and happening. The returning to our everyday routines have been slow due to the uncertainty of the continuing wildfires. The Litton waves are back, and what I mean by that is, that's the Litton wave. So here's here's where we are. We've got our new band office. It's like 11 trailers, truck trailers put together. We've got a community store that opened up. So we no longer have to travel to the Lillowood or Hope or Kamloops for grocery shopping. Uh, we, we now have a small store. Uh, we've got a small community kitchen. So when, like a little coffee shop, community kitchen where we can have breakfast and lunches. Uh, the thought here or the hope here is that the construction companies come in will we'll have a place to eat and get some food and meals and whatnot because it is Litton and we only have a small store which has limited supplies too. So the local kitchen is connected to the, the new temporary community hall. So this is where we've been having our events. We've had some Christmas parties, some children's children's parties of sorts and whatnot, uh, just get together as community groupings to get together and talk and meet up, meet up with people that we haven't seen since the Litton fire. Uh, we've got a post office, so our post office is up and running. The RCMP station, they're up and, up and operating now. Their, their systems are all good and working. The ambulance station, the ambulance just parks out in the open. The paramedics stay in this trailer. It's just a, a mobile trailer that's put into place and that's their makeshift quarters, I guess. And here's the new IHA emergency building, I guess, emergency medical building that was just put in this past summer. So now we have a doctor's clinic again. We can go there. Uh, we're starting our own food hub that's under construction right next to the community kitchen and community hall. And yeah, we're we're hoping to get into utilizing a food hub in our area because we have a big area and a few bands that could definitely benefit having a food hub. Uh, going forward for safety, we're now, I don't know if you want to call it fire smarting, but we're just getting rid of all the unnecessary shrubs and dead trees and whatnot in preparation of uh, future fires. So we're just making sure our surrounding areas are, areas are safe from any future spark up of a crazy fire. So what has, what has Luton First Nation O&M Department done for improvements? So since the Luton fire, the O&M Department has done, has started, we keep our water tanks filled at the end of each day. So we'll drive around with our water trucks empty. And at the end of the day, we'll fill them up and park them. And that just helps with a quicker response. Uh, we've increased or upgraded the fire equipment, our plows, sanders, and heavy equipment. That's all brand new. Uh, like I said, leadership was tired of their own M department having nothing but breaking down equipment. Uh, we have no excuse now. Uh, we've increased our field staff, pretty well doubled our double the staff in the department. We have equipment and tools on each side of the river. We have more radio connections, more, more radio communication, I mean. And we also created group chats. So the group chat thing is something my assistant came up with. She showed me a group chat that she built on her phone just for the own end. And it's got all of our guys' numbers tied into this one chat. So when she wants to put a, a, a work request out, she'll put it on there saying, can somebody respond and do this? And somebody from the group chat will respond saying, I can take care of that. So we've got a group chat for the staff. We've got a group chat for the other departments within the band as well. Uh, we've also got cell phone boosters inside each, each of our trucks. So we can get a, we can use our cell, cell phones in more areas. 
We've installed, installed the electrical auto disconnects on each of our water systems. Uh, we've developed the fire mitigation plans for our water systems, increased the increased fire first aid and EOC training courses within the within our area. And we also have go bags and proper gear for the crew. So the go bags we have inside of it, water, uh, snacks, whatever the operator thinks they'll need if they if they're ever isolated like we were for a few days at a time, uh, water, chips, pop, snacks of some sort, uh, a change of shirt, uh, the proper gear, we've all gotten the fire, uh, the same, pretty well the same gear as the forestry crew. So we've got some fire resistant pants, the boots, the shirts, we're now wearing hard hats. And uh, yeah, so changes within the department have gone over well. And this is our C-CAN for our fire gear. Not all of our fire gear is in there yet. We are presently servicing some pumps when I took this picture, but this would be loaded up with our water pumps, all of our fire hoses and other fire gear that we use. We have our building protection systems, uh, a large field, a large sprinkler system that we hook up to a, a pump and soak down a large area instead of a small area with our smaller pumps. But those are the, the upgrades and changes that we made that we feel will help us uh, respond to any future fires. So when I talked about the Stein water system in the beginning, so before the disasters, we only had 150 residential connections on this system, one health center, there's a 22 unit seniors complex, the hall, and the school. And today, roughly, we've got 179 residential connections with, I think, 25 more planned coming up in the future. The health center, the 22 unit seniors complex, the West Side Hall, the Stein School, and now we have the post office, the band office, the IHA emergency care center, the grocery store, which is going to be connected soon, and the trailer parks. So we've just totally overloaded our one water system, but this Stein water system is in the plans for upgrades for its intake system and, a, and larger storage water reservoirs. Those are in the planning stages now. And this is for the highlights of what we have done in our community. Uh, little thank you cards from my nephew to myself and to my partners that helped save their house. That was a good feeling. So, and that's it. That's all my slides. I guess uh, we went over, but we're ready for the Q and A. I guess. Thank you, Warren, for that outstanding presentation. Um, I sorry to put you through this emotional <laughs> turmoil all over again. It happens every time we talk about it. Oh, yes. uh, but thank you for that outstanding presentation. Uh, we will take some questions now. Uh, if you could please uh, put them in the chat, I will read them to Warren and he will answer them. So. Oh, um, so Warren, first question is, what is the app you use? Um, what Sorry? are the apps you're What are the apps you're you're using uh, that, for communications and for monitoring? Yeah, the app is. I don't know the exact name of it, but it is Aqua, an Aqua intelligent made up app that they put onto the market. It's, I knew this question was going to come up, but it's installed on my operator's phones. I don't have it installed on my phone uh, just because I've got a lot of stuff on my phone as it is. Uh, anytime I want to want information on my water system, I'll look to the operators and say, hey, can you open up your app and see how the system is doing? Or I've got a warning on my, on my email from the Stein water system. Uh, can you check the app and see what's happening there? And they'll just do, they'll open up their phone and say, oh, no, everything's good here. Or they'll be, oh, no, one pump is down. We'll go over and check it. 
but I sorry I don't have the name of the app. Um, we have another question from Shakti. Thank you very much. So good to hear about your experience. No, uh, no questions, just uh, appreciation. So you're, you're welcome. I'm glad you took the time to listen. Uh, Christopher asks, what lab test did you conduct on the water system before going back online? Uh, we did the in-house positive negative water sampling for E. coli and coliforms. And the other samples we sent to the ALS lab here in Camels to get further chemical analysis and whatnot done. And once those were, once those came back clear and good, uh, that's when we were able to take the boiler advisories off. So we had in, in-house testing, and then we also had the ALS lab testing. So we did send samples out to try and get our two, two positive or two negative, depends on how you look at it, samples back so we can get the water flowing again. You get a complete analysis done, Warren? A complete uh, analysis from ALS? Yes, yes was... ALS. Sorry. Okay. Uh, no, Jim I'm... asks. Oh, Jim oh, asks. Sorry. Are your pump houses now set up to quickly connect to the gensets? Yes. All of our water water stations are now connected with the automatic disconnect switches. Uh, they were just. They finished the installation, I believe, that near the beginning of summer. So all seven systems have that quick, quick disconnect now. Okay. Uh, Jonathan shares, just wanted to say thank you for that wonderful presentation and the stories and the experience yeah. shared. You're welcome. <laughs> and Steve yeah. says, sorry, no questions, but great presentation and stories. Thank you so much and glad to hear that you're getting some positive outcomes on the emergency preparedness. Um, Brian asks, can you change any of your surface water to groundwater? No, we we could not just because of the, the layout of the land and basically the location of some of these water systems. Uh, one of the systems we did look into uh, transferring over to a, a groundwater system, but the it, it wouldn't be sufficient enough as compared to the surface water that's already working there. Yeah. So and, wouldn't be any and, then, and then you have also um, uh, implemented point of entry systems, right? Because of the isolation of uh, the different reserves and the number of connections, you had to be quite innovative in finding solutions to provide water. Yes. Yeah, because some of the systems, we we can't figure out a an overall do all and fix all for higher water system. So that's why we started looking at the point of entries because there we can just treat the water for one house instead of uh, the whole neighborhood, which uh, definitely cut the cost down because we're just putting a small treatment system inside the house versus building an entire treatment facility to treat two homes or three homes. And that's all, that's all these reserves have that are on the POE systems, which is two homes and three homes. So they fall under the ISC, uh, threshold of having five homes or more to qualify for a centralized water system. Uh, Raymond asks, aside from what you mentioned in changes since the Litton fire, what were your biggest lessons regarding emergency preparedness? Uh, communication for sure. Uh, some, some of my friends will know me, I'm very big on communication. And from the Litton fire, when we had no communications, it was a bit of a, a gong show. But once we established a, a way of communicating with each other through our own radios, it sort of calmed down. But by the, that was in the 21 fires, but by 2022 fires, 
we didn't lose cell signal or anything else. So we still had good communication along with our cell boosters and our, our truck radios. Communication was the most important. Uh, and like I say, we upgraded our radios and everything so we, we can improve on that communication. Uh, we've also got radios with the forestry channels so we can stay in contact with some of the forestry crews as well. Uh, and the other, the other benefit or the, the other biggest thing is definitely creating good friendships or relationships with the local local agencies agencies such as the wildfire service, the RCMP, uh, the highways highways company and whatnot. Yeah, just developing relationships and having good communication. Uh, James asked, great storytelling. I'm wondering, knowing what you know now, if you had time to plan for the same event all over again, what key things would you focus on investing your team's time or in terms of preparation? We've actually started planning last week on this new upcoming fire season. Uh, we're planning just as though we're planning for the 2021 fires for sure. Uh, uh, we're trying to be ready for anything. Yeah, we're just planning for everything and anything. Uh, we're looking at new filling filling zones. So as you see in the picture here, we're filling from one creek. We're having to use a pump, but there's other creeks in our in our vicinity that we can possibly hook up a gravity feed system of some sort and have uh, pit stops sort of for our trucks to stop in grab this hose, hook it up, open, we'll get a dump, dump of water into that tank and we can go on. And once we have that dump of, dump of water in our trucks, that filling tank that we're feeding off of will be empty, but we'll be filling again with the, with the creek's gravity flow. So th those are some of the ideas we're, we're floating around, but we're trying to see how we can do the creek thing without affecting anything in the natural habitat of that creek. So we're not getting a, what do you call it, fisheries and oceans breathing down our neck. Uh, Gary asks, I was surprised at the number of different systems that were providing water to five to seven residences. Yeah, our systems, so Lytton First Nation, in this area, we have 56 reserves and 33 of them are actually occupied with people. So some of our water systems will feed three or four all at once off of one centralized water system, but we're spread so far apart that we couldn't connect one water system to the other with three kilometers of dirt road in between. So that's why we have so many systems spread apart and feeding, excuse me, so little houses. And, that, and that's the only way we can do it just again, just because of our mountainous terrain and all the creek passages that, that a water line would have to cross. Collier says, thank you very much. A appreciate your presentation. Sounds like you have a good team working with you. I know you're very proud of your team, Warren. Yes, uh, the team that we that I have now is one of the best teams I've ever worked with anywhere. Uh, these guys are just like one big family. We all joke together. We all have fun together. We talk. Uh, we're, we're teaching each other. If we learn something new, we're showing everybody else what we just learned. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like a, a bunch of brothers working together and a sister and we, we all just get along. We do have our minor little headache, or not headaches, our minor little issues, but I think we've grown up enough that we'll actually stop and we'll talk with each other about those issues, one-on-one -on -one versus everything else some people do. But no, we, we are one big family now. I really feel the, the positive vibes of this group. There are lots of thank yous, and they're very proud of what you have done and accomplish you and your team, Warren. Lots of thank yous coming. Uh, Lyndon, you. would you change anything about the components of the water 
treatment systems based on what you learned, ways to increase robustness or future disasters? Yes. So with the Stein system upgrades, we we are looking at improving the intake system as with the Stein system, the intake is the crutch of that whole system. Uh, it just can't take enough water out of the creek fast enough to have our Stein system operate at a higher level. So that's that's in the planning stages now for in, for better water intake and we're planning for a larger reservoir as well, like a, a third reservoir adding to that 160,000 gallons. I think we're gonna be, I can't remember the, the size of the reservoir, but it's gonna be another big reservoir. Um, Bradley asked, did you ultimately have to replace the media in the slow sand filter? And thank you for your presentation. No, we didn't have to change the media. Uh, like, like I said, we got the water flowing through there within eight days or so, eight or nine days. And yeah, we, we went in, cleaned all the reservoirs out for that system. And we also did a, a scraping of both filters just to make sure no contaminants were left on top. But yeah, that's, sorry, that's the other part is we're, we're also planning a third filter cell for that that system as well. Okay, and it'll be a slow sand filter, like expanding the slow sand. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh. What what advice would you give to other First Nation communities developing their own emergency plans? Uh, definitely know your systems. Uh, have a look in your area to see what kind of creeks you can take water out of. But you got to also figure out how you're going to take the water out. Can you take it out by the pump or can you have some sort of gravity fill system? Uh, everything that we've developed in our in our community is just sitting in our office up with a chalkboard and just drawing stick figures up on the wall and showing how we're going to do things and how we think it's going to work. And once we have time, we'll go out and try and see if that that idea will work or not. I mean, if it doesn't work, oh well. If it does work, big plus on us. So a lot of the planning is just from us sitting down and talking, talking amongst ourselves. Okay, how about this system? We can get more water if we do this, or we don't have to take water from this system if we go to this creek instead. So we do a lot of that just in our office and planning. And once we have something that we know will work, we'll bring it to the leadership and let them know that this is what we came up with. Uh, we might use this on the next fire if it needs it. If not, hey, it's been documented and this is how we can do it in the future if needed. Uh, Shakti asks, sorry if I missed this, but what were people doing for drinking water during the emergencies? Did you get water hauled in? Uh, for the Nohomeen fire, yes, we had water hauled in. Uh, we were dropping water off at all the homes. But for the Lytton Creek fire, no. Uh, water wasn't hauled in because town was evacuated. It was under a mandatory evacuation for a couple of months. And during that time, it was just myself and my water team that were going around the Lytton area doing what we can for the water systems just to get them up and running. But yeah. Uh, with the community aid stations, I guess, and the neighboring bands, uh, groups were dropping off cases of water and whatnot. Uh, my own house, I think I had four cases dropped off there just for our household. And like the village of Lytton, they were dropping cases of water off to the houses that were left in Lytton with uh, bottled water. And the same for Lytton First Nation. We had a centralized site where a truck would drop off a bunch of water and people would come in and grab what they needed. Uh, others, like I told them, just boil your water if you're going to drink out of your tap. Okay. Uh, Joanne asks, thank you for the presentation. What would be your biggest piece of advice for other small water systems that might not have trained operators like yourself 
to prepare for these types of emergencies? Uh, definitely start cleaning up your yard. Uh, get a good good barrier around your your water system. So clear a bunch of debris away, anything that can burn or could potentially harm your water system. Uh, get rid of it. Go go as far back as you can. Uh, one of my operators with our seven mile system, the fire actually went past that and went around that system. But Dion, my operator, he worked that system doing the fire smarting and he is very proud of that. And every time we talk about that seven mile system, he reminds me. So who did the fire guarding around that? Did it work? Did that fire guarding work? So yeah, he constantly reminds me on that. But that's, we're doing the same for all of our systems. So we're, we're clearing more and more brush away. So we can still have the building standing if the fire goes through. Okay. Danny asks, awesome, passionate presentation, Warren. Uh, I noticed there will be more serviced homes on your Stein system. Is this an, an indication that members are comfortable with returning to Lytton and and their confidence in their ONM staff's ability in dealing with future natural disasters and keeping them and their infrastructure safe. I am definitely hoping that's what they're thinking. <laughs> but I mean, most of the temporary homes that were put on the reserves are homes put in for the people that lost their homes in the Lytton fire. So once the people in those temporary homes start getting their homes rebuilt, they'll be moving out and that house will then become open for another band member to use who doesn't have a home. Uh, but yeah, just like anywhere else in BC, housing is an issue in our, in our neighborhood as well. We don't have enough houses for our band members. We never had enough before and we don't have enough now for sure. So yeah. Mark asks, what would be some good recommendation for other communities that will be facing a fire from your experience? Uh, start planning now. Start, start looking around your neighborhoods to see where, where a fire could start or what could feed a fire. Get to know the direction of your winds for sure is another big one. Like when I was going into the Lytton fire, I knew the wind was always blowing from Vancouver and blowing towards Kamloops. So I knew I had to set up on the Vancouver side of town to safely fight this fire. And that's the same with the Nohomeen fire. When we responded to that, we drove to where the fire started because the wind was blowing towards Kamloops again. And we just sort of got in behind the fire and sort of followed the flames. But yeah, start your planning now. Again, have a look at your water sources. Is it adequate enough to feed a, a water truck? How can you feed that water truck? Do you have enough fire pumps? Are, the, are your fire pumps good enough? Are they powerful enough? Do you have enough fire hose? Uh, do you have enough fire nozzles? Uh, these are all the things that we're going through ourselves. So I think we've just ordered about six or so fire nozzles to restock what we lost. But just Think in general of what you're going to need when a fire, if a fire comes through your area. And from that list, see what you already have access to. And then go shopping for the rest or try and find funding opportunities somewhere to help with those costs. Okay. Jim asks, how well do you, how well do your treatment plants handle the fire flows? For example, your slow sand, can you bypass these treatments in an emergency? Uh, the slow sand, it's very good for the initial attack, but once it runs out of water, the recovery rate is like a day to a day and a half to recover all of the water inside of our reservoirs. All the other smaller systems, uh, they've got some bypasses as well, like I showed in the picture there, but some of them we won't be able to bypass at all to get the water flowing so we, we would just have to leave them and hope for the best 
or we'll come up with a, some sort of plan of having a water truck or something there. But yeah, all of our water systems, they, they would take time, they would require some time after the initial attack using up the, the water, all the water in the first, first go, and then it's waiting after that. Jessica asks, can you highlight any plans you have for drought response? Ooh, we are just in the process of talking about that. Uh, we haven't had a, I haven't had a meeting with leadership, but for my department on the drought, we're just, like I said, we're looking at creeks and how we can uh, come up with a, a filling station that we can have the the gravity flow of the creek feed a water bladder and then have that excess water exit and go back into the creek so it doesn't harm the creek in any way, but we're we're keeping a tank full at all times. So we're we're thinking like that. Uh, yeah, anything where we don't have to use our water system's water to fight fire is what we're trying to plan because the last thing we need is people running out of water or will develop another issue from from doing weird things during a fire. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, do you, um, you know, considering considering the approaching summer, our water system at risks of drought? Oh, uh, I did ask the operator how our creeks were looking that are feeding some of these water systems. He said they are looking normal, but it's hard to say right now. Uh, this is such a weird winter, like everybody else is saying. Uh, we, we haven't seen any freshets like we've seen in the past, not like the November floods and whatnot, but we're, we're just going to wait and see and go from there. Uh, we will be having um, a drought, a webinar on drought later on in the year. So, um, Hopefully, some of the questions will be answered at that time. Lyndon asks, would you change anything about the components of the water treatment systems based on what you learned? Ways to increase, oh, I think we asked that question already. I th uh, sorry, that question was already asked. Would you change anything? Yeah, okay. Um, we are at uh, 1242. Um, Warren, thank you for that amazing presentation. Uh, I have a question for you, and which has to do with, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, mental health of your team. Um, you have faced these emergencies, you know, usually with emergencies, we think they happen once, but yours happened many <laughs> times in a row. Um, how did you deal? How did you support each other? And um, and I know it's such an emotional ordeal to go through and revisit all these. And and we know that it's not the end of emergencies. So no, uh, great question, Sagwinder. Thank you for asking that because I forgot to put that in my presentation here. But just shortly before the 22 fires, the Nohomin fires. I called in a therapist to sit down with our crew and talk to each one of them one-on-one -on -one in our office. So other other band staff also came in and took advantage of that. So we did have a professional therapist come in, talk with my guys, including myself, and other other people amongst the band, and we're in the process of planning a we're trying to plan for that person to come back and see where we all are today. Uh, yeah, that's something I'm working on. But uh, that that question did come up with my assistant because she was asking about our mental health. And I said, uh, do you know of anybody that that's a therapist that's willing to come into the field and talk with our, talk with our people? And she did. And she called up that person. He came in and yeah, helped everybody. And, that was great. Okay. And and it's important to stay on top of it as well, right? So yes. Yeah. Okay. Hoping hoping we can get them back soon. Okay. 
Okay. So uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. If you have any subsequent questions, please jot them in the chat box and we will uh, try to get back to them. Your certificates for CEUs will be automatically emailed to you. And then please remember to save them because we cannot reissue them. And then, then you should submit them to EOCP. Our next webinar is on March 12th. Uh, at the same time, 11 a.m., and it's going to be by Joanne Edwards, the Provincial Health Officer, and the Provincial Health Officer Report on Clean, Safe, and Reliable Drinking Water. If you wish to read the report, the link is also provided in the notice for the webinar. Um, anyway, we look forward to having Joanne talk about her report at our next webinar.